Uh, I'm sorry. Do, do, we, do, do you use like commercial code to make this log? Or yeah, it's all it's all commercial. It's all standard. So some quick measurements here. Um, what I've got in the in the blue is the energy per cycle. Um, in black, we've got the uh, frequency of this thing. So first, look at frequency. So you go down voltage. We're looking at a kind of a narrow voltage range here from 0.9 to about 0.45 volts. You do see a pretty dramatic drop off in frequency. So down here at this really low voltage, you're only operating at about 70 kilohertz. So it's very, very low frequency. Um, for the purposes of academic work, it's fine to go down there and look at that. It turns out that probably most people, most of the applications we look at really don't need more than more than 100 kilohertz or megahertz or something in that range. Um, it's, it's just that uh, people kind of have it in their minds that they need a 10 or 20 or 30 megahertz microcontroller. Um, but you do get a you do get a performance uh, hit from low voltage, but you also get a pretty dramatic energy benefit. Uh, down here at the, at the 0.5 volts, which is the target operating uh, voltage, we're getting about 2.8 picojoules per cycle um, at 100 kilohertz. Now, uh, for those of you that think in microwatts per megahertz, this is equivalent to 2.8 microwatts per megahertz. So picojoule per cycle, or picojoule per uh, cycle, and microwatts per megahertz are actually the same, interchangeable. So. Um, this is uh, very, very low. Your typical off-the-shelf microcontroller today is somewhere north of 200 microamps per megahertz, and you have to multiply the voltage. So you're, we're, we're talking uh, quite a bit lower than your typical off-the-shelf devices today. Um, looking at the active mode energy, it's almost all CPU. Some of it is the memories, uh, and, and basically zero of it is the timer, but it's almost all CPU. It's that low voltage is actually helping us out quite a bit. Uh, the other thing we, we looked at was sleep mode. This was really the, the core of it. Um, the key number here is that when I've got 50% of memory retained, so it's a very small, I think maybe two kilobit memory, very, very small, um, we're at, at about 30 picowatts. So this is about 10,000 times lower than anything you'll see out there today. Now, admittedly, it's a simplified device. I would never stack this up head-to-head -head against a commercial microcontroller, but it just shows what's possible when you start applying some of these techniques. Um, one of the key things I mentioned earlier was the memory. So you can actually see the current consumption of the memory is a function of the amount that's retained and the rest of the number of bytes is actually retained. Um, and at the peak, it's somewhere about 22 and a half picowatts is what's consumed by the uh, memory in sleep mode. So it's actually the memories in sleep mode that tend to dominate the, uh, the power consumption. Now the timer uh, normally would be the thing that dominates your power consumption, but uh, we do have a unique uh, architecture here in the timer that I won't, I won't talk about today, but I'm happy to do so after. Uh, so, given this microprocessor, we go back to the original application. 10 minute sleep period, we do that 2,000 instructions in this temperature sensing application. Uh, in this case, given that same one millimeter square battery, our active energy is 5.6 nanojoules. Sleep energy is still more than active energy, but, but these, they're now comparable, and we can hit about 15 years with that profile. So, uh, suddenly we're able to hit some pretty impressive battery life with a very, very small battery. Um, that led to the second generation of the processor, where we said, boy, this, this whole 8-bit processor is just kind of, it's kind of silly. It's not real. Uh, so what we did was we, we had, at that time, struck up a relationship with ARM. And ARM gave us access to their uh, Cortex processors. The Cortex-M0 hadn't quite come out yet. So um, the Cortex-M3 at the time was the lightest weight microprocessor. And we incorporated that. Uh, had a range of peripherals very much like before. Um, you can see three kilobytes of memory, so it's actually larger than we had previously. Two kilobytes of uh, non-retentive memory. That means memory that's power gated in sleep mode. And then some peripherals, a capacitance, a digital converter, and a temperature sensor. Now I'll talk about, this is, was specifically designed for a, a medical application that I'll talk about in a moment, but, um, but uh, these, these two peripherals are pretty important in that particular application. Now what I've, I've, I've coded this diagram to indicate what's awake and what's asleep in the uh, sleep mode. Uh, these devices are ungated, so that's that's things like your, your wake-up controllers are always awake. Um, partially gated are elements like your uh, your retentive SRAM. We shut down the peripherals, keep the array active, uh, or your boost converter and power management circuitry. So we've actually got a little charge pump in there that, excuse me, that can recharge a, a thin film battery. And um, then finally you've got your fully gated elements, your, your sensors, uh, your capacitive converters, the actual core itself is fully shut down. 
so this again was a processor that was built both for low voltage as well as from the ground up for speed mode. And uh, this is the die photo. Um, this one is actually quite a bit larger than the previous uh, device. Um, the, the two things to know in terms of area are we've got these big SRAM uh, banks. We've also got a big switch gap network. This had a little uh, charge pump on board, entirely integrated, so no off chip fly caps, uh, totally on chip caps that allowed us to recharge a, a four volt battery, which is uh, pretty important here. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about integrating with the battery in a moment. But uh, again, we see the we see the uh, in blue the frequency, in black the energy for instruction. Um, one thing to note here is that is to remember that I said that there was an energy minimum that at some voltage you reach a minimum volt. That's what Bose research showed us. If you actually go down here, you can see that minimum right down here. Um, this would, in theory, be the right place to operate if, if we chose to do that. Now, earlier we talked about a lot of the challenges of whole voltage. You see, with you, suppose we backed off to half a volt. In this particular device, you could still hit a megahertz. If you backed off to 0.8 volts, you could still hit 17 megahertz. And, uh, and actually, this going too much higher than this, you start to run into problems with flash memory, for example. Embedded flash can, can tend to hit uh, higher performances. But, um, you know, it, it turns out that you can back off that minimum pretty effectively and still get pretty low energy. So, so in your chip, do you have only one voltage domain or do you have multiple voltage domain? Um, we have one voltage domain in the sense that it's only one voltage chip wide, but there are multiple power domains that can be powered up and down independently. So, um, there's, there are, well, I'll, I'll say there are, there are two voltage domains, and there's a low voltage domain and a high voltage domain. One that interfaces with the outside world, but there's the low voltage domain wall of the sensitive, where that the power critical stuff lies. Have you measured the temperature sensitivities on the power yeah. profile and how is that works across yeah, the voltage? So, right, yes. Yeah, the um, you know it depends on what you're measuring. Um, active power is pretty steady with with um, temperature. Um, Depends, of course, on what frequency you operate. If you always operate at the maximum achievable frequency, at, at low voltage, we have this interesting thing of at higher temperatures, you go faster because it's, it's more leaky, so you're operating on the leakage faster. Um, and so uh, it's actually possible that at higher voltage, were you to operate at the maximum possible frequency, you, <coughs> your power would go up. But um, the probably more important thing, thing to think about is leakage power. Leakage power goes up at, at high temperature, and sleep mode is the thing that I said is really important. Um, many elements in the in the system are temperature sensitive in the same way that we determine. So your memory leakage, for example, is going to go up in the same exponentially just like any other chip out there. Um, your other elements, for example, timers, which may be temperature compensated, will be pretty steady in power <coughs> temperature. But you're going to see in some elements that exponential characteristic. But that's inescapable. Any part out there is going to have that same now you can certainly compensate for it. There are a lot of techniques with voltage scaling that can compensate for temperature, but um, it's one more moving part. So we have uh, memory uh, measurements, well, sleep measurements as well. Um, again, this is the same curve that shows the total leakage versus voltage, as well as just the, the retentive SRAM. And you can see that that retentive SRAM is a big portion of it. It's about 80% of the total power uh, down there. Now the timer is about 20%. Um, again, we have some unique uh, architectures there that make that important. Interestingly, the, the Cortex M3 is virtually nothing, 0.01%. It's absolutely uh, minimal there because of a lot of the power gain that we get. So uh, I alluded earlier to the fact that this is part of a um, larger a larger system that was meant, meant for uh, an implantable medical app. Um, this was the assembly that, that was pulled together uh, as a first order demonstration of that. What we have in this in this picture, um, you can see it on, on top of the penny, you can see just how small it is. It's about, I think, nine cubic millimeters in, in total volume. Um, but when we zoom in, the bottom layer is a battery. This is from a company called Simbat. They're making a very a, a thin film battery that's very, very small. Um, the middle layer is the device, the, the microcontroller with the Cortex uh, M3. And then the top layer is a solar cell that we made in a, um, actually it was in the same 0.18 micron process manufactured right next to the next to the microprocessor. We just cut it up and, and put it right on top. Um, now I'm gonna the, the secret <coughs> here is that this device was never actually functional as we see it here today. This is a, this makes a pretty picture. The functional thing was a little bit 
less pretty. It was assembled in a, a typical engineering breadboard fashion. But um, we did get this up and running, and I'll, I'll present some measurements on the next slide. But um, the, the net result is that this little system here can effectively operate, call it nearly perpetually. Uh, the reality is that due to physical wear out and you know, a lot of other reasons, this thing won't last forever. But uh, essentially, we've reached that, that power critical point where there's zero net energy loss with only minimal light incident on this uh, on this solar cell here. So we've gotten the power down uh, far enough that this, this thing can stand alone. And uh, if, we, if we actually look at the measurements, what I remember I said that we've got that little charge pump and we've got the solar cell. We can actually dump charge on the battery. Uh, that's what th this this uh, plot here shows current versus time for a, 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 a situation where we uh, wake up, sleep, wake up, sleep, and measure the current. What you can see is that when we're active, current goes negative. It means we're taking charge out of the battery. Um, but you can see that the charge or current actually goes positive in sleep mode because what's happening there is that the current we're drawing is, is actually far less than um, the amount of current that we're getting from the solar cell, and so we're actually able to charge up the battery there. And you can see that charging happening here. Um, this is the battery voltage, and you can actually see the sawtooth. We're, we're here discharging it, and then we're charging it slowly with the solar uh, cell. We're discharging it, charging it slowly. So you can effectively, uh, with, with a carefully managed system, uh, continue to, to run this thing for a very long time. Now, as I mentioned, there are battery wear out problems. Uh, these things only have so many charge discharge cycles built into them. They tend to be pretty darn good compared to your uh, you typical off-the-shelf point cell. And uh, when we we did some calculations here based on uh, essentially calculated how many measurements we could do in a given day, assuming a certain amount of average incident light. And um, you know, obviously, the more light you have, the more computation computational cycles you can do in a given day. Well, the assumption here was that one measurement cycle requires 10,000 instructions on the cortex. Um, but uh, the the key number here is that um, if I'm measuring uh, 10 measurements per minute. So that's actually quite a bit. I'm able to go essentially nearly infinitely. That means until battery wear out or component wear out, we have zero net energy loss there. So um, that's a pretty pretty compelling thing for a lot of applications that need 10, 20, 30 years of battery life. And there, uh, you know, it turns out even even a really big battery kills itself after a while due to thermal stress, due to, due to self-discharge and so forth. Um, there's a real need, even for, for batteries of a lot of capacity, to have rechargeability and, and to be able to last for decades at a time. It's become pretty compelling. A good example is in uh, energy metering. Um, companies spend a lot of money for, a lot of money being six or eight or ten dollars for a battery that can last for a very long period of time, for 10, 20 years, without killing itself. And uh, when you start looking at a system like this, it becomes possible to do that without spending six, eight, or ten dollars. So this was ultimately actually meant for a medical application for specifically intraocular pressure sensing. So this is uh, all pretty crazy, but the, uh, uh, today doctors uh, and glaucoma patients measure pressure fluctuations in the eye. Uh, every, probably a lot of you here have been to the eye doctor have gotten air blown in your eye, and it's kind of annoying. And also the problem is that for glaucoma patients, it only happens when they visit the office. And so there was a real need from the doctors to get a profile of activity all day long and over a prolonged period of time. And so they were very interested in building a little device that could go in the eye and stay there for a long time. Um, and so the, the vision here is to make a little millimeter cube device, or a millimeter on a side device that can be just put onto the eye and, uh, and then read wirelessly with uh, for perhaps a, a near field plane or there's some other, there's some other ways to go there. On or in? Pardon? On the eye or in the eye? On the eye. So uh, it, it needs to be in the fluid in the eye, but it's essentially on the eye. Um, I, I, what I don't have here, unfortunately, is actual pictures of the device. Uh, there's some, I can't actually show um, the most recent device because it's going to be published with ISCC. So you guys should go see that ISCC. It'll be really cool. Review it in two weeks or whatever. Um, so that device is meant to actually be just pressed under the eye. It has little legs that grab the eye. It's all very weird, but uh, I'm not a, there's a reason I'm not a doctor. Uh, so it's all very weird, but it's, it's really cool. We're, we're essentially there. and We've got all the components functioning separately. We've got the pressure sen MEMS pressure sensor, microprocessor, the battery, packaging to all integrated. Uh, the challenge now is to actually make a, a, a fully functional device. Unfortunately, that's the thing that acad academia isn't very good at, is actually making devices. Because it doesn't, making devices like that doesn't necessarily yield great publications. 
but uh, I think we've got a really good group. <laughs>